and and in my dreams I recognize how beautiful that place was. I recognize it then, you know, like, oh, this, I miss this place. I miss yeah. being here. But when I was there, I didn't really recognize it very much. I was just enmeshed in it mm-hmm. and it didn't really affect me, I guess, the way that it should have. And I think about that a lot because yeah. I think about how, how when you talk about how your father, you know, raised you to fish in some ways we do things to sort of go back to what felt right as a child, you know, what, what connected us to our father and probably what your father, how he felt when he did it, he was connected to his father or, you know, a lot of what we do is Mm -hmm. just to feel a sense of connection to those that came before us. And as a result, you know, and and Mm -hmm. if that connection itself is also providing a connection to the earth, to the river, to the life that is, moving and and thriving in that river then then that experience is automatically imbued with meaning it it has to be right yeah i mean for me if i just go on fish it's a little bit of a stretch for me to kind of i mean aside from maybe just having just this innate sense of wow this is beautiful there isn't necessarily mm-hmm. that depth that you would have not only of knowledge because obviously you know how to fish you know how to do everything that is necessary to do that successfully i of course don't have that knowledge Mm -hmm. but also just the connection that you've had to your father and the father before that and the father before that i think that that is a big part of it It has to be yeah i yeah i've wondered sometimes uh, you know how people uh get very upset about particular rules Mm -hmm. of grammar or uh you know when culture changes and a word, the the meaning of a word shifts, or we start using what was a colloquialism as now the ordinary usage. And some people get upset about that. Probably all of us get upset about it uh, in in various ways. I think that's because language and grammar, vocabulary connect us to people, and that connects us to the people who who first raised us. To some degree, it's like re-entering the the streams of thought and the streams of language we we grew up in, and we all have a sense of the importance of defending the the water that sustains our lives. Yeah. Um, for me, as a as a fisher, um, one of the things that I've found uh, since I've started teaching reef ecology in in Belize is that uh, much of what's driven me as a fisher is not just the um the connection with the past uh but also the connection with what lies under the surface of the water there's something um i think many of us maybe most of us uh feel this when you go to the ocean that you look out um uh, on the vast ocean and what's the line from that song the uh, the ocean is a desert with its life underground mm-hmm. um and you know, you look out over the surface of the ocean and you might not see much. Occasionally you might see uh, a, a whale breach or a fish leap uh, out of the water or something like that. But you get the sense that there's something big going on underwater. And I think many of us who fish do so because the the fishing line is a it's like a telescope that allows you to see or sense or feel something that's deep under there. Uh, obviously, it's not the same as putting a camera down there or diving down there, but you kind of you throw something out there and say, I wonder what will respond. Mm. And, you know, the, the ways that other creatures know the world, we can learn so much from that. The fact that there are animals that use echolocation to know the world. Um, I, I think is uh, it's it's just fascinating. There's there's a species of bat you can find in the American Southwest that hunts scorpions. When I first learned that, I was <laughs> blown away by that possibility. I, how how does that come about? Wow. How is it that there is this creature that can barely see? And, and you know uh, you know how important for those of us who uh, who see well, um, the sight becomes like a, our main way of knowing the world. Or, or one of our our most cherished ways. So you get this creature that that can barely see. It flies around in the dark, and it uses its ears to find things. And somehow it's using its ears and its voice to find a scorpion on rocky ground. 
And then it is grabbing it with its face. It's grabbing this thing that the rest of us are terrified of. The scorpion is almost as big as that. It grabs it at just the right point on the scorpion's tail so that the stinger cannot get the bat. And you think, how do you learn that? Right. <laughs> what made this species think, oh, that's, that's going to be good food, that thing that's making an echo over there. And I'm going to fly in such a way that I'm not going to smash into a rock and it's not going to sting me. Yeah. I mean, these are things... When you learn them, they, they should make you go, there's so little I know about the world. And it might even be that once I start to know that about the bat, I just learn something new about myself. Uh, you know, you think about the times when you have been trying to find your way through a room in the dark. And it's like you lean into your eyes, like eyes, see more, see more, and they don't. Mm-hmm. And then you, if you allow yourself, you'll realize, oh, I can shuffle my feet. Yeah. I can reach out with my hands. And then you start to realize that little things like your sense of smell is actually helping to guide you. If you remembered where the coffee pot was, you can still find it by the sense of smell. And all you realize, I'm, I'm kind of like a dog in this. Or like a moth. You know, these animals that find things by their sense of smell. And you can even hear your way through a room if your hearing's good enough. It's, it's kind of, uh, kind of mind boggling. <laughs> 